Good afternoon. Welcome to this panel on uh, investigative journalism. I was just rushing back from a panel on fake news, and it's, it's fascinating. We have a panel on fake news followed by one on investigative journalism, as though there is something as non-investigative journalism, and then there is investigative journalism. Anyway, nonetheless, thank you very much for turning up. It's a, it's a reasonably packed hall. Um, so the, the topic is very simple. Investigative journalism is high risk, high cost, high chances of failure. How can we still make it a priority? And I've got a fascinating set of three panelists. To my immediate left, Srinivasan Jain. Everybody knows Vasu. Srinivasan Jain is the managing editor of NDTV, India's most respected 24-hour news channel. He presently anchors an award-winning weekly ground reportage and investigative show. It's called Truth vs. Hype which focuses on political corruption, conflict zones, and untold stories of social and economic tensions. He also anchors a daily show, which is called Reality Check, which aims at debunking official myths and government propaganda in what is a post-truth environment. He's been with NDTV since 1995, during which time he's done stints as managing editor of Profit, which is NDTV's business channel, uh, as well as the head of NDTV's Mumbai Bureau for eight years. He's anchored major primetime news telecasts and discussion-based shows. He's been a recipient of numerous awards for journalistic uh, excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, Srinivasan Jain. <laughs> to his left, Marissa Kwaitjowski. I hope I've got your surname right. Uh, she's an investigative reporter for the Indianapolis Star. She handles investigations relating to social services and welfare issues, including child abuse, neglect, poverty, abuse of senior citizens, human trafficking, domestic violence, and access to mental health services. Marissa has earned more than 50 journalism awards, including the IRE's Tom Renner Award, the Sigma Delta Award in Public Service, the KC Medal for Meritorious Journalism, the Will Rogers Humanitarian Award, and the Indiana Journalist of the Year. Prior to joining the star, Marissa worked for media outlets in Northwestern Indiana, South Carolina, and Michigan. Marissa Wachowski, welcome to the Media Rumble. And to her left, Jay Majumdar is based in Delhi. Uh, he's currently with the Indian Express, where he's part of the global investigations into the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. Back in 2005, Jay exposed the local extinction of tigers in Sariska during his first stint with the Indian Express, which was in 2001 to 2006. Earlier, he had worked with Amrit Bazar Patrika, as well as the Sunday Observer. Jay Majumdar, welcome to the Media Rumble. So let me start off with uh, Srinivas and Jain. At a time when you're up against, you know, the 24-hour news cycle, the internet, Twitter, Facebook, how do you as a journalist, as an editor, make investigative journalism worthwhile to editors and, and more importantly, to media promoters and media owners? Right. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, now, uh, you know, I think that uh, one of the things which... I suspect all of us here on this panel will agree, since we do in investigative uh, work of some form or the other, is that the main thing you need are benevolent employers, right? I think that's the starting point. You need organizations and you need editors and promoters who are willing to actually invest in this kind of work. Uh, without that, it becomes virtually impossible to do long-form work or investigative work because that is resource-intensive and that is... Uh, you know, something which is time consuming. So if you actually look at the organizations represented here, and uh, you know, even outside of this, you'll find that it's typically those organizations and those promoters and those institutions which are willing to invest in this kind of work, like the Indian Express, for example, and I'm sure there are examples in America as well, uh, where this kind of work is done. So the idea that you just have to sell investigative journalism to your promoters Half the work is already done when you have promoters and editors who actually think it's a good idea. Because frankly, it's not very clear whether or not investigative journalism actually has real sort of uh, you know, rewards for organizations. Uh, you certainly get the glory, you get awards, but you actually make money off of it. Uh, does that actually help you sell more newspapers or do more people watch your channel is something which is not clearly being established. So I think there is an element of a leap of faith that organizations make and feel that this is just worthwhile and it's worth doing and it's worth investing in. Um, as far as I was concerned, I have to confess, I didn't start off doing investigative journalism. I just happened to, uh, in a sense, fall into it 
when I was trying to figure out what to do apart from the daily format of prime time nightly news anchoring, which anchors who or television journalists who spend a certain amount of time uh, in an, you know in the media till the point where their hair becomes white, uh, all tend to gravitate towards doing. So you sit every night and then you know you have the six box format, and and that's how it rolls. So. I think the idea to break away from that and do something which was ground reportage based and to actually go out and try and unearth stuff which the regular news was, was not covering, that itself became a kind of unique selling point for the show and also for the network. So they could turn around and say, look, we're not just playing the, the noise game, the nightly opinion game, we're actually investing in you know, intelligent, long form, in-depth journalism. And once we actually started to make an impact, so I think the main thing is because, like I said, the financial rewards are hard to quantify. Uh, there's also the headache of the risk of perhaps potential lawsuits, so you get calls from you know, people in authority that promoters have to deal with. But you then do get the advantage of standing out. So once we started actually reporting on stuff and quote unquote started breaking stories, uh, whether it was to do with corruption scandals, whether it was to do with unearthing the political design behind different phenomena, whether it's a sectarian riot, or even something like drought, where you go and look at what were the man-made aspects of what is causing drought. Once you actually started breaking stuff, then it becomes viable and exciting and interesting for promoters and editors to invest in it. And then it sort of sets off a chain reaction. So I think somewhere along the line, that's, that's really what led us to, to uh, sort of double down on the work we do and to support it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, so, that, so to that extent, I, I really do uh, owe a debt of gratitude to my employers and editors because there are frankly very few TV channels that are invested in this kind of work. Sure, sure enough. Uh, you know, the, the point that Srinivasan made, and I, I want to ask Marissa this, is there any quantifiable sort of data that suggests that if you do investigative journalism, which is high cost, which is high risk, you're ruffling a lot of feathers, you're upsetting a lot of people who are, you know, uh, the powers that be, is there any quantifiable data to suggest that it leads to a bump up in circulation or it leads to a bump up in, in ratings in a way you can justify to your employers that it was worth their while? I think that we've started getting to the point where we can start to quantify those sorts of things. At the Indianapolis Star as an example, in the wake of our investigation into USA Gymnastics and Larry Nasser, they did have special subscription promotions about that type of work and that was tied to our investigation. And they did find a significant increase in subscriptions as a result of the work that we were doing. Now, did it pay for all of the money that the company invested in our investigation over a two year period? I don't think we're quite there where we can say that. Um, but I think they're starting to get to the point where they realize that investigative journalism is something that people are willing to pay for and they're trying to figure out how to navigate that dynamic. It's interesting because Jay works for a paper which, you know, is notorious for its circulation. Uh, how, how do you then convince your editors, how do you convince your management that this is a story worth pursuing with its inherent costs and with its inherent risks? Uh, yeah, because you're not in the circulation game. You're not in the 8 lakh, 10 lakh category. So how do you then convince them that this is worth their time and money? Um. See, money is certainly a factor, which we all agree, but uh, if you are in the business of news, let's think that way, that if you are in the business of news and not views or propaganda, then, uh, and, you, and you want to profit from merit, then you have to invest in news gathering. That has to be a priority. It makes business sense. And, and, and since the vast pool of common news is so widely accessible these days, so only so much in value addition you can do. So that means that your USP has to be uh, your uh, exclusive stuff, and that's where uh, investigation comes in. And I think for that reason, I would say that uh, uh, this would be the last thing on which one should cut cost. And uh, I can't uh, speak on behalf of my organization, but uh, it could also be a culture, as uh, Mr. Jade was saying. That, uh, but uh, you know, more than public interest or such things, which are all very fair and true, it should be done in self-interest to, to remain credible and to, to remain relevant. Zaka, I just want to make a quick point uh, to your question 
about, you know, is there any evidence to actually prove that investigative journalism does well? I actually put this to Mike Resendez, who's part of the Boston Globe Spotlight team. I was on a session with him at uh, the Jaipur Literary Festival, and he actually said that, so two things seem to have happened since Spotlight came out. One is that they've actually drastically cut down the number of resources they have. The team has had to seriously downsize itself. But he said that every time Spotlight published a story online, they had a huge surge of traffic coming into the site, and that was also driving newspaper subscription, and therefore had some kind of financial benefit. So at least in that particular instance, he said that it's a myth to suggest that this kind of long-form investigative work doesn't have actual financial rewards, but, it does. But what, what about in your own experience? I mean, you've been doing this for 20 years. Do you have evidence to show that the work that you've done has actually led to a substantive increase in, in ratings or even revenues for your channel? Because there is a substantial cost involved. Yeah, I mean, NDTV is just rolling in money uh, and in ratings <laughs> yeah, we know because, of the, because of the work that I've been doing. And they thank me every day for it. But uh, look, you know, you're in TV, so you know how the whole ratings game goes. Uh, you know, the question of television ratings in India is very fraught. I have to say that, and uh, certainly it's, it would be very hard for me to make the case that it's actually brought any uh, direct financial benefits. But two points. One is that while, you know, the sort of, um, if you take the ratings aside, if you look at the wider question of buzz, which is what every journalist lives for, that your story should be talked about the next day and the next day and the next day, right? So I think to that extent, certainly the work that I've done and also the other investigative work that, that you know, NDTV does, you get that satisfaction. You get the, the, the traction, the buzz, the fact that people are talking about you and about your story, uh, more importantly. So there's that. Uh, the other is that there's a certain uh, sort of prestige factor to investigative work, which can get translated in the form of awards, right? Uh, you know, these, these fine journalists here also have a bushel full of them. And I've heard from my sales teams that when they actually go to sponsors and to clients to pitch, we may not be the best or the highest rated channel, but they can go with that and say, listen, we're the channel that broke that great story, or the, you know, that great story, and we got these awards. And they claim that helps them get traction. So, Fair enough. So, I mean, there's that sort of trade-off. Where it gets, you want to make a point, sorry. Steve, here, uh, our new Frank, I mean, it's not that uh, how much money you make out of investigation. And it is true that there is a financial uh, problem, but it affects investigation the other way around. It is how much you lose from it. So when you do investigations right, they tend to offend people more often than not. And if those people are your advertisers, your, your, your revenues dry up. But then you don't need investigations for that. Sometimes if you simply report facts, there are people who get offended. Yeah. So you have to either uh, succumb and stop pretending or draw a line. So I mean, it's as simple as that. So, so how do you work that challenge, Marissa? I mean, where a story that you may do may or may not upset potential advertisers or even existing advertisers. And I'd even take that forward to the point where there's so much cross ownership of media, at least certainly in India today, where you know, your owner could have potential business interests in, in lots of other industries. How do you then weigh that with the impact of your story, which may ruffle feathers both you know, amongst your bosses as well as amongst your uh, advertisers? I don't. It's not my problem. I mean, you know, the work that I do, I'm focused on what is best for the community and looking at the impact of the community. So I'm not considering whether it might affect advertising. We have an entire department that worries about advertising and selling advertising. I'm focused on the story. Have you ever been told by an editor you can't do this story because this is a big, I mean, it affects a big advertiser or this affects our, our promoters? Have, have you ever been said that? No, never. Ever? Never. Wow. And I think also that comes down to bosses, as you were talking about. I have amazing bosses who believe in the importance of investigative journalism. So they, you know, those conversations may be having, being had at a level that's beyond mine, but at my level, nobody's ever said that to me. All right. I, I think that's, that's fascinating in and of itself. But I, I want to sort of extend this to, you know, the, the investigative journalism vis-a-vis -vis the daily rigmarole particularly in television, and I'm sure this is the case in print as well. 
where you're just up against this universe of you know, Twitter trolls and, and fake news and agenda-driven stories. Do people really have the time and space and bandwidth and interest for you know, long-form investigative journalism? Well, uh, look, I think they do. But again, when I say this, the question could be asked, how do you prove it? Uh, there's one way to do that is to, again, look at, for example, uh, readership or circulation, viewership, or if it's an online site, you look at traffic. But even if you take that away, coming back to what I said about the buzz that stories generate, right? What are the big stories that just in the Indian context that have excited us or got us talking in the past, let's say, several months? The Wire story on uh, Jay Shah, right? Uh, the Caravan story on Judge Loya, for example. Now, these are all big investigative long-form stories in which those organizations invested considerable amount of time and resources. A Panama paper, of which these guys were part of, which I think went on for at least a good part of a year. Um, and there are so many international examples as well. You know, the, the big Ronan Farrow expose on Harvey Weinstein. Uh, so clearly these stories, you know, generate a lot of traction. Uh, there's a lot of interest in them. People read them, they talk about them, they consume them. Again, does that come down to any kind of commercial benefit is open to debate. But I think that precisely because we live in such a time of fake news and, propag and you know, government propaganda, uh, just literally dr you know, we're drowning in it, I think there's a great deal of interest that people have in intelligently reported uh, news. They want stuff to be fact-checked. They want power to be called out. So I think there's almost a kind of counter effect of the times we're in, that there is a greater appetite for it. And in a, in a strange way, you actually see news organizations responding to that in different ways, and actually you know, becoming alive to the possibility that this is actually the kind of stuff we should be doing. Well, one of the other risks you run, and I'm sure you've faced this as well, is that you've, you've reported a story, it, it's created a buzz for a few days, and then you know, there is this black hole, for example, in the, in the Panama Papers case. I mean, it, it's moving so painfully slowly that you're not actually able to show people that, look, we exposed the story and therefore, you know, the, the investigative agencies were forced to do this and so-and-so person as a result against him or her, you know, the, the, the agencies got in, uh, the, a trial is on. It, it is so painfully slow in a, in a country like ours that you're not able to show results for it, at least certainly not immediately. How do you deal with that? Well, that's not for us to uh, uh, really be bothered about, because you know you can only do so much and not more. And uh, if you are glory hunting, uh, which happens, I mean, uh, that you have done a story today and you have impact tomorrow, that's all fine. But uh, in such investigations, uh, frankly, uh, we're not expecting some action overnight. And it can't happen also. It has to follow the due process of the law. And what exactly the government is doing, the government is um, entitled to not reveal also. So, so in, uh, is it, sorry, uh, isn't there an element of glory hunting in investigative journalism? The investigative journalist is always seen as, oh, those guys, <laughs> sort yeah, of thing, yeah, right? Yeah. No, no, I, isn't there? Yeah, yeah there is. Uh, there, there is this element of glory hunting, and there, and uh, but uh, before that, uh, I would like to uh, say something about this issue of uh, cost. Mm -hmm. I'm coming back there, there again because you know it's uh, it's uh, overblown. Because I I'm, I know I'm sure uh, two of you will, will also know that there are so many reporters inside and outside the, of the mainstream, and many of them many of them freelancers who would go to any extent to get an investigation done. Sometimes spending out of their pocket because the um, uh, the fees barely cover travel and time. It's not ideal, but there are people that there are reporters of varying uh, ability who are there to do it. Now, you can get around the budget. What you can't get around is the policy of against publishing anything that will offend somebody important. That's the main problem. So, that's, so, so the discussion we're having now is important, that uh, this is high cost, high risk, with a very low strike rate. But uh, I think we're avoiding the, uh, the real obstacle. It's not money. It's those policies. You think the bigger, the bigger devil in the room is the fact that editors slash publishers will not carry a particular story because it offends some people. Yeah, it is. That's the bigger yeah. devil than 
the yeah. cost associated with investigative journalism. Yeah. How do you deal with that? <laughs> how, do you, how do you solve that problem? Those are, those are things that are not going to go away. I mean, ABP News gives you one model of how you solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> just has it just sack, sack the journalist. If, we, uh, if it were a matter of uh, cost and finance, then all big investigation do, would be happening in ITO. It doesn't happen there, no? But, but Marissa, is there something that we can learn from, from America? Obviously, it's a much more saturated, much more developed uh, media market than it is here in India, where one of the problems that a lot of journalists face is the fact that there are certain stories that will not go. They will just simply not be published or simply not be run because it offends powerful people. Is there, is there anything we can learn from, from the American media experience, the American media uh, uh, you know, market that, that might delink the whole process of you do journalism, you do stories for whatever they're worth, and then whether or not it ruffles feathers is a completely different conversation altogether. Like you said, you know, you've never been stopped by an editor because it, your, one of your stories would potentially piss off an advertiser. I think the challenge is that it's so specific to the people who are in charge of the organization because I've been blessed to work for people who were investigative reporters before they became editors and so they have a passion for that kind of work. And I do have colleagues who have had stories that never saw the light of day, not necessarily because of advertising but because of connections or something else. Um, I think it, I, I don't know how you solve that problem really other than to have people in those positions who are willing to focus on what's important because I don't serve, I mean, in a way I'm an employee of the Indianapolis Star and Gannett, but I serve the community, I don't serve my employer. Zaka, just to add to your question, uh, the point Marissa is making that, look, we're talking about all this in a, in a sort of an abstract sense, but let's ground it in the context of where really we are, right? Now, America is in the age of Trump and India is in the age of Modi. Uh, now, Trump has thrown out a challenge to the American media, right? And they've given it back. He's getting it back in full, in full flow. And that's partly because they do have very strong free speech laws, as we know, that, that protect them from any kind of actual direct consequence of saying something like, Trump is a liar, Trump is a racist, calling him out on a regular basis. Uh, you know, the worst that could happen at this point at least is that he calls them fake news or abuses them. Here in India, the consequences, as we know, are much more real. So I think that's one big difference. We simply do not have the legal architecture, nor do we have a culture of respecting the media uh, to that extent. And the second is simply resources, right? I mean, when Spotlight came out, uh, the w you know, around the world, the sort of, in every newsroom, there was this whole business of, wow, where's our big spotlight story, right? Uh, and, you know, again, I had a chance to ask Mike Resendez this. He said they work six months to one year on each story. And the, the resources that they had to commit to the church story, he said, came to about a million dollars, both in terms of the reporters that uh, were invested in it and legal fees. I agree with Jay that not every great investigation requires money. But that's the kind of resources that, particularly in the West, media houses are willing to devote. Plus, like I said, you have the legal architecture to back it up. So the contexts are very different. And you know, I think we still have a ways to go before we can get to the kind of journalism that we'd like to see here. All right, so what I'm going to do is, uh, with due apologies to the folks at News Laundry, is to devote a little more time for our, our audience questions. Because this concerns you folks as much as it concerns the panelists here up on stage. Will you be, A, willing to pay for investigative journalism? Uh, do you think it's worth the while for media organizations, for journalists, to be investing money and time and resources in that kind of journalism? Uh, I, I think these are con questions that directly concern you, the viewer, you, the reader, you, the listener. So I'm going to take an, another extra maybe 10 or 15 more minutes uh, in audience questions. So my only request is uh, put your hand up. Identify yourself, identify your organization if you work for one, uh, and direct your question uh, to whoever it is uh, directed to and name that person. And, and let's stick to questions. Let's not you know, bring in opinions. We have a lot of that 
in this country already. So, so let's, go, um, let's go from here. So I'll go one, two, three, and I'll, I'll do the th same thing again, one, two, three. So let me start with the lady here. So the thing is that, you know, if people in India can fund uh, Kejriwal's party, why not they can fund an investigative journalism if there's a, if there's a hunger for, uh, for people who want to know? And that's how actually the respect will come, because you're talking about how people are going to respect. Uh, the, the, there's the whole thing that, you know, people have to start respecting, uh, you know, media the way for it to actually bring out or unearth those stories. So why not? Why not start that? You think it can be started by, like you did, like uh, NETV has already done that. Why not others follow the suit? What is stopping? If people can fund a certain political party slash ideology, why wouldn't they fund good journalism? Well, uh, they actually do. I mean, uh, you know, The Wire, for example, is trying to crowdsource funding in the Indian context. Uh, so are other online portals. And people do seem to be subscribing. I don't think they're necessarily only funding investigative journalism. I think right now the bar for what counts as just independent journalism in India is set so low that people are just happy to pay money just to hear the truth. So I think that's something which has already happened. I think it's harder for legacy media organizations of the kind that you and I and perhaps everyone here works for to actually seek funds through crowdsourcing. But you do see this now on several uh, prominent newspapers, online sites like The Guardian or The New York Times, for example. Yeah. They'll say at the end of a piece, listen, you know, if you want this kind of journalism, subscribe. So I think to some extent that's already started happening. All right, uh, the, the gentleman there. Yeah. Hello, my name is Pranjal and I'm a lawyer. So just to give a perspective from the other side, especially when stories like the Jai Shah stories were run. So there is a perspective that most of the time when such kind of stories are run, we are not approached by people who is actually getting defamed or so to say allegedly getting defamed, but we are approached by the promoters of who have several interests in the companies that people like Jai Shah may be invested in. And it's those promoters who are also running these news channels. So th it's their discomfort that is very visible. So in terms of investigative journalism, as we were discussing the business model, one is that how much of traffic do you actually get by running that story? The other is, say today you have an illegal mining story in Chhattisgarh and the promoter of the media house is involved or invested in a uh, mining industry. How then do you go ahead with that story or have the budget or do you then have the backing of your editor in, in that sort? All right. Uh, you want to answer that? I mean, you, you're, you're a live example I'm, of, uh, I, of I'm parts actually, of your story not being no, no, I'm actually suggesting that you answer that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. I, I've never even attempted to. So, no, so. No, Jay, you want, you want to say that? Uh, in such a situation, probably uh, that particular organization uh, won't cover the story, as simple as that. And um, I can tell you from my experience that I spent um, many years as a freelancer on my own. So in every house, you will find some holy cows. <laughs> so as a, as a freelancer, you have the option to bounce around the story. Usually somebody takes it, if you're lucky. And if you're, if you're not a freelancer, then you, you, have to found, you have to find a house uh, where such problems don't occur, or at least occur rarely, like Express, or hopefully the other houses. And I would add, add one thing here uh, to her question, that you know, uh, when, when crowdfunding happens, as you say, to a political party or ideology, it tends to follow that pattern also in the media. The first example I remember of crowdfunding is not new. It happened with Tehelka years back, and we know that uh, how it panned out. But uh, unfortunately, now um, there is a trend of you know uh, uh, preaching to the choir. So we have some media brands which are read and propagated by certain people, some other media brands which are read and propagated by some other people, and they don't talk to uh, each other. So if crowdfunding happens. I think it may also follow a pattern that uh, uh, a group of people with a particular ideology are funding one kind of media and the rest funding another kind of media. So it may not be uh, a, a solution that way. Uh, I think that's a great point. I mean, how do, you, how do you speak to the other? I mean, we're all living in these echo chambers of our own. Uh, there, yeah. I think the, 
I think I want to uh, get on the cost bit as well, and uh, I'm in a room full of journalists, so please don't hit me with this question. So the idea of corporate partnerships in media houses, uh, can, that can, can that benefit uh, you know, publications as well? Because you know the idea of Jeff Bezos in the Washington Post, I know how he's promoting journalism as well, and the infamous case of Gawker, you know, where Peter Thiel you know, went, uh, you know, he's a billionaire, he has all the money and the power in himself, to go against the media organizations, and in, especially in investigative journalism, where you have certain, uh, you know, you go through the previews and the ideas that, you know, you, you poach a lot of people outside, and they have vested interest in certain aspects. So if they come calling, and you have to have a certain backing of money, and if these corporations can help you with that, uh, shouldn't media organizations, you know, go ahead with the idea that if they can get the money, because Gawker went bankrupt, and they did yeah. such good journalism back then. Right, good question. Marissa, you want to answer that? When, when Bezos acquired Washington Post, everybody was like, you know, oh my God, this is the end of it. But it's actually, for whatever it's worth, seemed to have become a better paper. Well, and Jeff Bezos is a person, not a company. But of course, he does own some pretty significant companies. I think that's a difficult question to answer because I think it depends on the relationship between the organization and the corporate partner because one of the things that benefits our organization is its independence. And if you have a corporate partner, you have to create either an editorial separation or you have to figure out some way to navigate that relationship, just like you do with advertising, where um, if you're a major grocery store chain and somebody on our investigative team is writing a major piece about that grocery store chain, they have to have the ability to still do that in order to maintain the credibility that we've earned within the community. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think that you would have to think through how that would work. All right, from this side. Uh, oh, right, there's a lady here. So now the John Oliver show, right? Uh, he often picks up topics which don't generally get uh, you know, mainstream media attention. For example, waste generated from uh, nuclear reactors. Nobody cares about that uh, ideally, right? Um, but the thing is, he really dumbs it down for the audience, the complicated topics. So maybe the questions that were raised at the beginning, um, they can be answered by a better packaging of investigative journalism. I mean, just asking. Do you find that sometimes it's too difficult for people to understand? Maybe a certain dumbing down is required. Oh, yeah, maybe the comedians do it better than <laughs> most of us. We dumb down all the time. Uh, no, I think, I think she's right. I think that uh, you have to find different ways of telling stories. And I think the idea that we are now these, you know, the old idea that we're these oracles talking down to our audiences has to change. Uh, we, I mean, you know, we try as much as possible to to keep the story as lucid and simple as possible, uh, to not you know, make it too dense and heavy. But the fact is that you know, even in John Oliver's case, uh, leaving aside the fact that he presents it with an element of comedy, you do have to get through a lot of complex facts. You have to get through numbers. You have to get through data. And it's all the more challenging in television. You can still do it in print, but to do it in television is challenging. So yeah, I mean, we, you know, we keep trying to tweak and experiment with forms. But I guess, yeah, there's always scope to improve. Uh, the gentleman there at the far back, yeah, in the black, in the black shirt, yeah. Um, I've come of age, I think most of us have, in a world where it's not surprising when the government or a big business is screwing the little guy over. As investigative journalists, how do you reconcile what you do with this pervasive sense of disillusionment out there? Are you disillusioned always, Jay, as, a, as an investigative journalist? What do I look like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> All right. My name is Man. I'm a market research cons cons consultant. And my question is for Srinivasan, sir. Like, before 2017 Gujarat elections, most of the cable operators in Gujarat were not showing NDTV. So, but there was no way to take your journalism to the audience, in, uh, to the ground level. So, how to tackle with this problem? Uh, yeah, I mean, NDTV.com is one way. Look, I, I think what you're talking about that happened in Gujarat, those are exceptions, right? Uh, media organizations face blackouts or there are ways that are found of trying to stifle the news. But it's true that, this is, I'm not saying anything very original, that in the digital age, it's increasingly harder to do that. So even if you were to try to shut down broadcast of a channel from a particular place, you, you know, the 10 other places where it can surface, so 
I don't think that's really something which is a matter of concern unless it starts actually affecting your ability to generate good content and generate good stories. Well, that's true. But I think through smartphones and so on, people do get the information. But like I was saying, I think the problem is not, not so much cutting off a channel as much as cutting off, finding ways to cut off resources to that channel or threaten that channel or newspaper organization where they actually become disincentivized to do investigative work or any work which speaks truth to power. And I think that's the big problem we have in India right now. All right. We'll take a question from that lady there. I'm Tanishtha. I belong to a small city in Punjab. And uh, specifically in those news bureaus, there's no as such a person who's aggressively covering investigative journalism. Or he's an investigative journalist. There are like four or five people. Some of them get tips and they, they are uh, a, an internal part of uh, revealing the sand mafia over there, over there, if just an example. I just want to know that is investigative journalism just to the national level? Or is that, what role do those people play in this whole uh, machinery of investigative journalism, the regional context. Ma Marissa represents uh, n certainly not a tier one city, it's a tier two city, if I can use, use that phrase. I mean, it's Indianapolis, it's not New York. It's definitely not New York. Um, it, yeah, there's absolutely local journalism and actually some of the most amazing projects that I've seen in the past few years in the United States have been from very, very local organizations that are doing local journalism that um, may not be national in scope. It may just be looking at a specific school district or a specific company that just operates there. So there's absolutely a lot of fantastic journalism happening at the hyper-local level. And that's, it, it needs to happen there because there's a lot that could be looked at in that realm. No, I think just to add to what Marissa is saying, I mean, even in Punjab's case, the whole drug cartel and the drug stories actually got exposed by local media there, and then Urta Punjab happened, and everybody's like, oh my God, there's a problem in Punjab. Also, Zaka, just to uh, further add to that, if you think about the journalists who actually get killed in India yeah. doing work which is exposing power, those are local journalists most of the time. It's very rarely that people who are yeah. in this you know, level of of the media get those sorts of threats. So it's, it is true that you know, local journalists are, in some ways, they're right in the front line. Um, hi, I'm Ayushi. So um, as you said that there's a problem with uh, who promotes the investigation that you all carry out. So um, just before this, I attended the session on fake news. And it seems as if there is a, there is a need for being uh, being verified or maybe being supported online, like somebody has investigated, they found out a fact. I know a friend who did, and his tweet got retweeted by uh, Shashi Tharoor. So it's it was so in investigative journalism, you pick out facts, you research into it, but it's the same question again. The smaller freelance thingies, like the freelance uh, journalists, if you do not find somebody to promote the story that you've uh, that you've actually found out about, what do you do to it, get the story out? Like there are some um, news portals online which yeah. are relatively newer and they do not have the big names behind them. And it's only by chance that so if somebody picks it up from there and it takes it forward. It's, it's a so good question. How do you you, get you, it you've out? worked with the Express which brings with it a certain, you know, a certain resonance, a certain standing. I mean, a story is on the front page of the Express. It naturally, you know, tends to go viral. You've also worked freelance. Did you find a difference? You know, you could have done quality work, you could have done great stories, but somehow they don't find the same kind of resonance as when they do appear on Express Page One. Yeah, that's true, but uh, it will always depend on the, uh, on, the, on the image and the credibility of, of the outlet. So uh, it's only natural that uh, if you have a story on, uh, on Express, it may have some, uh, some more resonance than it, if it appears in some in some local paper, so, so that's... Uh, so it's harder for a freelancer to get sort of, let's say for want of a better phrase, a national traction on, on your story than if you were... Uh, depends on the freelancer. So <laughs> if you can have access to an uh, equally credible publication, so 
and freelancers also write these days it's it's getting uh, uh, increasingly rare but till some time back freelancers would uh, also write news and not only views in uh, in many of these publications that's unfortunately getting rare so, some of the best journalistic work actually here in you know today is being done by freelancers it is. right the the caravan story was the the judge loya story was broken by a freelancer uh, neha dikshit i think was just here on an earlier session she's done some fantastic work you know investigative work doing freelance so you know this is actually in some ways again going back to the context we're in this is actually a good time for journalists who may be freelancers or for news portals that may not be entrenched within the, the sort of mainstream yeah, system well, what he's basically saying is you know god save the rest of us who are in the legacy media but anyway that's the unsaid bit i think the gentleman here and then last couple of questions uh, shrinivasan and jay you've had your share of online threats based on as a response to your stories you've seen the famous it cell at work have you ever physically felt scared for or of a threat to your life has it affected your life in any way not just threat to your life let's say but any threat uh, a chance of violence yeah. wow um no i won't uh, i don't want to be melodramatic and and say that i mean uh there have been threats but frankly nothing that i would say is to the same extent in volume as some of my other colleagues either women colleagues have got or threats that those who work in the vernacular space have got but yeah it i mean it upsets you it can ruin your day but i wouldn't say i've actually felt like physically threatened all right last couple of questions so the one of the biggest problems when we did carry the jaisha story was that how other media houses picked it up so uh, apart from ndtv to be honest everybody else focused more on uh, the piyush goel press conference and how a media house run by anti national people is whatever saying about amit shah's son but nobody really dissected the uh, facts of the story nobody we have been sued and we cannot follow it up now but nobody is really stopping any other media house ndtv included uh so i my question is actually to marissa i am not trying to call you out uh do you guys also face the same problem in the west because in india there is no sense of camaraderie when it comes to that so if uh like panama uh, papers was a different story altogether right because it was covered by the whole media right the world media but in india we often see that even with the judge loya case which was again one of the biggest stories in the last 5 years very few people actually take it forward and for better for worse it's the small organizations who are doing uh investigative journalism and our reach is very limited it's so it's an interesting question that she has i mean does it really matter if your story goes mainstream viral i mean if, if the new york times is to pick up your story for it for you to have actually arrived does that matter at all no i mean not to me um some of the stories i'm most proud of never went national or viral and i've been on both sides of the the viral component i've been on the side where i did an investigation and a ton of media outlets plagiarized it and gave me no credit and then i've been on the other side where with usa gymnastics 2 years later we still have major media outlets that are giving us credit where i'm kind of like you're still giving us credit for that i mean thanks so uh, you know i don't think that it is a necessity for us to do the work that we're passionate about that matters but um i can't control what any other media outlet does i can only control the way i operate so so, so just to 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 reiterate the the stories you're proudest of are not necessarily the ones that have gone national correct all right great uh last couple of questions yeah gentleman here i really liked uh the judge loya story i mean that really excited me and i was very disappointed in ndtv and in inexpress uh in their reportage you know and um, in one of the panels before you uh, we had anant uh, goenka here and who said that he stands by the story which was very sad for me because i mean it's so patently wrong you know it's so wrong you have a sitting judge who's been bumped off you know and they don't want an investigation so i mean this is the time like i'm a mountaineer this is the time like i see a k2 or a unclimbed mountain this would excite me you know this would be like my glory whatever you know that you said so why don't you like take it on like you said you know this is like your moment you know come on vasu this I mean, is your moment yeah. take it on and take it on man what are you doing <laughs> what are you doing i have one small question for marissa the question was to both actually i'm so, so glad he's not directed it to me you know i'm like just just no. i'm like this little chishai cat who's you know no, hiding no, behind the speak. chair and i'm like thank god i mean take it on 
Yeah, but uh, what exactly you're talking about? <laughs> no, I was saying, like, you know, you guys won the Pulitzer Prize, right? Like, for the Panama Papers, right? I mean, uh -huh. Indian Express, Ritu, no, no. Sarin, yeah, and yeah. the whole gang, right? I mean, this is like your... Which? I'm saying the okay. judge lawyer case. I mean, this is so easy to crack, okay, I mean. Okay, okay. So, uh, I can't speak for the organization, of course, but this is what I think personally. The story that you were probably mentioning, uh, for me, it's a, a proper legitimate news story. Three judges who claim to have witnessed an event, their account, makes for news. The surprising thing for me was that in that, in that report, there was a qualitative m a mention of the caravan story wh where um, a contextual reference would suffice. Now, to, uh, to many it appeared that uh, that reference uh, was suggesting that this account overrides the caravan uh, account. That uh, should not have been the case. This could be a, a, a case of uh, momentary misjudgment. But at the same time, uh, to, uh, to suggest that this was done under pressure or something, I mean, that's ridiculous. Okay, Le uh, look, getting into the judge lawyer story with a limited time is complicated. But let me say this, uh, you know, I think what you're trying to say is you're disappointed with the fact that we did stories that seem to, in a way, contradict the caravan report. Okay, so, so when you say that, you need to understand what happened, and I'm trying to, I'll try and be as brief as I can. When the story came out, we actually thought it was a fantastic story. So we sent our people down there to check it out, to see what more could we do, because this is someone else's story, right? So there's also that complication. How do you report on a, an investigation, something someone else has done? All media houses have that challenge. But we still did that. We sent somebody down to Nagpur, and we sent somebody down to where the family was in Maharashtra to try and piece together what, you know, what had happened. We actually found details which contradicted the original caravan story. So we, so we reported it. We didn't negate the caravan story, nor did we say that there's no reason for investigation. We said there are still many unanswered questions, but prima facie, those points did come up. And I think they were legitimate points. I think the questions that the Express raised and what we raised were legitimate points. Subsequent to that, Caravan actually doubled down and sent somebody back and, and sort of reinvestigated and were able to clarify many of those contradictions and then they ran with that story. Uh, should we have also continued to do that? Perhaps we should have. But we did not do it because of the fact that we were either scared or because you know, this is something that we felt was too hot a subject. It's just that our first kind of prima facie initial foray into it suggested that there were some weakness, uh, you know, weak links. Which the, you know, which the publication subsequently clarified. And I think if you, again, if you just look at Express or in the context of NDTV, it's not like we've shied away from the fight or from taking on big stories and going with it when most other organizations haven't. So I think it's a little unfair to hold us to account uh, just on that one example. All right, I think that's a great note to end uh, this conversation on. Thank you very much. Uh, you guys have been fascinating. Srinivasan Jain, Marissa and Jay Majumdar, thank you very much for joining us on the panel on investigative journalism.